Um, when I was, uh, I don't know, probably, I don't know, 10, 11, 12 years old, um, lived in North Houston. And my dad, my dad had a green thumb. He can plant stuff. He had roses that were real beautiful, very proud of them. And there was a season where he had a vegetable garden. And this seemed to be something that, I don't know, I don't know if it's with that generation. I remember I had various uncles and other relatives that planted vegetable gardens. I can tell you, y'all, that's not in me. You know, I just, I'm glad that that plant life exists, but, but it's not something I tend to desire to engage with, okay? Um, but at this time, he would get these magazines that dealt with gardening. And they had specialized plants and vegetables, and there was this, this corn that would make red and white corn. And, and I wanted to see this corn. And so my dad ordered it, and we planted this corn in the backyard. I don't know if it was like late May, late spring that we planted it. And I want you to know, at the end of that summer, this golden burnt stalks that were literally burnt, sunburnt stalks, no corn, just, just really tall burnt grass was there. Um, and and, and it, was, it had nothing to do with my dad. This was something that I planted that I was hoping to see. You know, and, you know various things could come into play. There happened to be a drought that summer. And, you know, in hindsight, I actually didn't water it. I don't, I don't know if that had anything to, to, to do with it not producing. Uh, but I don't know if you, if, if you think about, if, if there's been something that you've invested in and you were looking for something to come about and it didn't come about, you know, what you were looking for didn't happen. Uh, I don't know, some people go into college and they, they have these expectations of what their life is going to look like on the other side of graduation. And, and if you make it to graduation, it definitely didn't look like what you anticipated, right? Some people go into marriage and they're thinking about what life is going to be about and how this relationship is going to grow and flourish. And they just see this kind of romantic fading off in the sunset, old couple holding hands and somewhere along there... It ain't going the way that I anticipated, right? And we can get back later in life and think, man, all of the sacrifices and the choices that I made, it didn't seem to go the way that I wanted. As a matter of fact, the things that I was looking for never happened. And you can feel like you just wasted so much. So many choices, so many sacrifices wasted. You know, I think that's almost like the worst thing that you could have happen at the end of your life is to look back and to think about all that you have done and see that it never really came about to anything. Right? Everybody wants to have a productive life. I don't think there's a person on the planet that doesn't want to have a, a productive life. They want to see something come out of their life, something to be seen, something to be experienced, something they can look back on and say, yes, I'm glad that I gave up everything that I happened to give up because of this. But do we know really how to live a productive life? Right? We spend money, we buy things, we experience things, but when it's all said and done, is that a productive life? And Will we be able to say that we went about it the right way? Well, that's the question I want to answer this morning from God's Word. Real simple question. How can I live a productive life? And we're not going to actually hear this answer from me. We're going to hear from Jesus. All right? So John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Um, Jesus is preparing to go from the cross he has had this upper room discourse with his disciples, telling them that he's about to go to the cross. He's explained to his disciples that he's the way, the truth, and the life. He talked about how he's going to prepare a place for them. He's called for them to love them and to demonstrate their love by being obedient. Now he's going to talk about something else. John chapter 15, starting at verse 1. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. 
Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does, does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Now, this is the last of the I am statements that John uh, records for us that Jesus spoke. And here he talks about being the vine. Uh, Vine had a special understanding in the Jewish culture at that time. Typically in the Old Testament, when they would read scriptures and read about the vine, the vine represented Israel. And matter of fact, there are passages that talk about how God, in essence, took this vine out of Egypt and planted it in the land, but never received the fruit that he expected from it. And at the beginning of this communication with his followers, he describes himself not just as a vine, but as the true vine. And he talks about bearing fruit, right? That there's an expectation of productivity from life. That the father is the vine dresser, and he's looking for fruit. That he works with the branches so that it bears much fruit. And so we have this expectation, and here Jesus gives us the means of how do we produce fruit. Now, now to get the picture of what Jesus talks about using this vine, I think we have a picture um, of like a grapevine, right? And so we see the grapes, and the vine would be that kind of long stalk, maybe just at the very top of the screen, kind of coming down. And what he's describing there is the branches are those things that are going directly to the grapes, okay? And, and so the expectation when you plant a grapevine is to get some grapes. Makes sense. And here's his secret. Here's how do, how do I live the productive life, right? What is he talking about? He uses this word, abide. And abide in the Greek is the word meno, which means to remain or stay. And what he's describing to be fruitful or to have a productive life is to have this intimate union with Jesus. Right? This close, intimate union with him is the means by which you can have the productive life. So, you know, going back to that picture of the grapevine, it's impossible to see grapes come from a branch that's not connected to the vine. Right? Because the branch is only a connection to the life that comes from the vine. So, so, So the life that comes through the vine is what produces the fruit. And he's communicating this to his disciples at a time when he's about to leave, right? I'm I'm about to go. I'm about to go to the way of the grave. I'm going to be ultimately returning to my father. And so there's a time in which we're going to be separated spatially. But don't let the the spatial separation turn into spiritual separation. That you need to abide or remain in me. They had walked with Jesus for three years. They had followed him. They had learned from him. They spent time with him. They learned. They they did new things with him. He says, don't let that stop because of where I'm going. 
You need to remain in me. And if you remain in me, your life will be productive. In other words, what God wanted out of your life will be there as long as you stay connected with me. Now, he used the vine. I want to use something a little different, and hopefully this will work. I got this beautiful lamp that I swiped from my daughter's bedroom. Thank you, Kira. And if you, see, you can see it has a, a plug, and I have this extension cord. Hopefully you guys can see that. Now, y'all ready for this light to come on? I'm just going gonna, gonna to lay that right there. All right, hold up. Let, let me get the plugs a little closer. What's wrong with the lamp? Man, this lamp is defective. Because it just will not come on, even though it is close to everything that it needs. Matter of fact, there's some contact to what could empower it. But why won't it come on? Right? And so that's the difference with abiding. Abiding is in this intimate union with Christ. And the reason I, I, I use this illustration is a lot of folks go to church. Right? Some even pray. But they never experience the life or the power of Christ because they're comfortable being close to Christ but not being in Christ, right? Because he didn't say abide by me, abide close to me. He said abide in me. And so we can't be content, uh, content with a casual kind of Sunday morning when things get rough, maybe, relationship with God. That's not the, the kind of relationship the disciples had with Jesus, right? They didn't just pop in, oh, is he healing somebody today? Let me come and watch this. Is, is this one of the days he happens to be teaching something? Let me, let me sit down and, and catch the last 10 minutes of it. No, they walk with him. They spend time with him. They ate with him. They listened to him. They did what he told them to do. And that's what it means to remain or to abide. It is where Jesus is your all in all, where he is the center. Right? A lot of people look for and, 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 and kind of think of their faith as a means to get the things out of life that they want. Right? And so we pray for these blessings, right? And I'm trying to get a nice house. I'd love to retire at 55 and all of these things. And we think, okay, if I, if I pray and I spend time, let me give to the church, that'll be my means of achieving my productive life. But that's not the life Jesus produces. Right? That's not a picture of a productive life. The picture of a productive life is not about your blessings. It's about you being a blessing. Remember who the vine dresser is. It's not you. I, I love how he goes and repeats everybody's role. Right? He sp speaks of the Father one time. He's the vine dresser. But Jesus says repeatedly, I'm the vine. You are the branches. I am the source of life that flows through you so that what I produce comes through you, right? What does what is, what is a productive life look like, right? That's kind of a key question. We talk about being productive, but what does a productive life look like? Does it, does it look like this kind of easy life? Does it look like a life without trouble? What does it look like? 
Well, y'all, let's think about the agriculture for a moment. What does the vine do? Right? In, in, in the grand scheme of things, right, we think about fruit. What is fruit? You know, it's this kind of seed-bearing thing that facilitates the propagation of whatever it came from, right? Apple trees produce apples, but those apples fall and can produce more apple trees, right? But in the grand scheme of things, it's really the product of the life of the vine produced through the branches, right? It's the manifestation of that life. Let me explain this for a minute. You ever heard about couples, as they grow older, they start to look alike? Anybody ever <laughs> heard of that or, or seen that? I think we got a few that you can see. You know, this is actually a famous couple. Man, but look at that. That looks kind of incestuous, doesn't it? <laughs> right? We, we have some other ones, too. You know, these, these are couples, right? It's like, wait a minute. You might need to do some Ancestry.com somewhere. Now, now here's, actually, there was a study I read in Time Magazine. There was a study done in 2013 that explains this. That it's not just coincidence or just people kind of sub, being, applying their subjective perspectives on, on couples. That people have a tendency to like what's familiar. And that subconsciously, we look and are attracted to people who are familiar. And so in a study, what they did was they had various images of different people and they had the test subjects to rate them for being attractive. And what they secretly did with some of the images that they showed was they kind of blended the test subject's image with some of the pictures. And both men and women, both of them tended to choose the, 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 the images that actually had their own images blended into them. Isn't that something? Now, I hope that's not the truth for my wife. Listen, I need her to stay looking like herself. I don't want her to, if I can look like her, maybe that'll help to some extent, but not the other way around. Please, thank you, please. All right? But, but what I'm saying is, you know, that, that there's this thing that we feel that says that this thing that comes together kind of ought to start looking alike. And believe it or not, the scriptures tell us what a productive life looks like. Anybody want to guess? It looks like Jesus. <laughs> looks like Jesus. Uh, 1 John 2.6, 1 John 2.6 says, Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Y'all see that? It's saying that if I am walking with Jesus and I abide in Jesus, I ought to walk like Jesus. And so a productive life does not look like whatever I want to design, whatever I want to define for my life. It ought to look like Jesus. And the productive life of Jesus wasn't in mansions. It wasn't in early retirement. It was in his character. It was in his conduct. Right, that whole thing about the fruit of the Spirit, right? That joy, peace, love, patience, kindness, gentleness, all, self all of that stuff comes from the vine. And then we are connected with the vine, and as we are closely connected with the vine, then the life in the vine manifests through the branches. That's the fruit, ladies and gentlemen. Can you retire early? Yeah, but make sure that's the fruit when you retire. And so if I, if I retire at 55 or if I work to the grave, at the end of my life, what I wish to offer God is some joy. It's some peace. It's some patience. It's not just the character of Christ. It's the mission of Christ. He came to reconcile a fallen world. Am I looking to reconcile fallen people? Right? He commands his disciples to love one another. Have I lived my life loving one another? Because it doesn't matter if there's a fancy car in the garage. It doesn't matter if my kids grow up with multiple degrees. If the life of Christ didn't manifest in my life. Jesus says, if you're connected, you don't have to focus on the fruit. 
Because right? that's something we look at, and we look at our lives, and I say, man, you know, I don't see a whole lot of that. And we make this effort to, you know what, I'm going to be more self-controlled. Oh, I'm going to try to withstand and not be tempted. And, and what happens when you do that? You fall every time. <laughs> right? I'm going to try to be more forgiving. Right? You're stabbing it back three times, but I'm going to go back in the room. No, you're not going to get me four times. You're not, I'm, not, I'm sorry, Lord, I tried. And, and you're focused on the fruit. And he says, you need to focus on our relationship. Because if you abide in me, (laughs) you will bear fruit. Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. He just says it as a fact. And so the thing I want to focus on is my relationship. Now, this can be real scary. We read some things about the vine dresser throwing some branches away. Right? Those that didn't produce fruit. You may be thinking, okay, well, does that mean if I don't see fruit in my life, I'm not saved? Maybe. Does it mean that I lost my salvation? Never. See, what you do when you understand the Word of God is a demonstration of the fruit. Right? Even if I am not being productive, I'm not really been paying attention to my relationship, and so, yeah, you don't see the fruit. The fact that I go back and do something with my relationship is the fruit. The fact that I am repentant of my sin is a part of that fruit. But the people who just kind of go away and never come back, did they lose their salvation? No. They never were connected to the vine. Scripture says this in 1 John um, chapter 2, verse 19, talking about those who had gone away from the faith. It's the same John that wrote this gospel. He says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would, not, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. Now, we've experienced that here at the Way of Life Church. We have like church, all this pandemic, like I say, has affected churches all across the planet. And so in this past year, we've lost maybe 25% of our membership. 25% small church. It's like, man, that ought to be devastating. Now, here's the interesting thing. We lost 25, a quarter of our membership. But our giving never dropped. All right? didn't. Now, it, it took me a minute to kind of understand what, what happened, because at first I'm like, Lord, man, we got to start over, and we're, we were this kind of big thing, and he's saying, no, you got the same membership. Because I looked at the 25% that fell off. That 25% didn't come that off. That 25% never served on a team. At 25%, they didn't give anything to the church. (laughs) And and so it wasn't so much that the 75% increased their giving. It was that we just got our roles adjusted to what was our actual membership. And and, and that's what I'm trying to tell you about people who are not connected with Christ. Those people that kind of fall away and you never see the fruit, never see the fruit. It's not that they lose their relationship. It's proof they never had one. And you say, okay, well, 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 what does that mean about me? You know, I'm looking at my life. I'm thinking about where I am, and I, I don't go to church that often, and I, I don't want to invest in the kingdom work of God too much, and I don't do this, and I'm not real patient at home, and I'm not the most forgiving person. Well, listen, check your connection. Right? Just like with that lamp earlier, if I don't see light, well, let me go check the plug. And let me address my relationship. Let me draw closer. Let me abide in Christ. Well, how, how do I do that? Let me tell you three things you can do. Just real short, practical stuff. First thing I want to encourage you to do, pray like Jesus. I want you to pray like 
Jesus. Now, what, what, what do I mean by that, and where do I get this? We, we read in the passage in verse 7, he says, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. All right? Y'all remember reading that? How many of you actually believe that? Let's be honest. He gives a promise of guaranteed yeses to prayer. Y'all hear me on this? Because he says, whatever you ask, that's what's going to happen. And you can say, wait a minute, you mean whatever, whatever I want will happen? Yes, if you abide in Jesus. If you abide in Jesus, the answer is yes. And this isn't the only place that John records this for us. In, in chapter, uh, I want to say it's in chapter 8, he says the same thing. He said, excuse me, chapter 14, 14, 14. He says, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Man, okay, John, are, are you sure? You want to put that out there? Because listen, I prayed a whole lot of prayers and didn't get a guarantee. He, he says, if you ask it in my name. Now, in my name doesn't mean, like, you know, I throw Jesus on the back end of it. Because that's what we think, in the name of Jesus. Pay this house off. Right? In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, a 20% raise. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, these adult children find their own place to live. In the name. <laughs> but in the name of Jesus is in the character of Jesus. It's according to the will of Jesus. It is like Jesus. See, if it's not something Jesus would pray for, and we throw in the name on it, we're forging his signature. And, and heaven knows Jesus' signature. And, and so we can't submit something with a forgery and expect to receive what we've asked for. But if we do what's in his will, right? It's almost like acting with power of attorney, right? And the person has already communicated to you what they want, and you're just signing his name to what he already wants. He's saying, guess what? You're guaranteed to get what you want. This, he said it twice in his gospel. He even said it later in a letter. First John uh, chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. He says, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, that he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask for, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. Y'all, he's tripled down. Right here he is talking and writing about Jesus and towards the end of his life, he's writing to churches and he says, you know how to get guaranteed answered prayers? Pray like Jesus. And you know, I've seen this, right? There's a lot of hope so prayers I pray for. We hope that God would send these missionaries who've been kidnapped home. That's a hope. But here's what I know. They're going to be home one way or another. And so I can pray and know that's going to be answered. And you can have these type of prayers in your life, right? A lot of times you're praying, those of you, if you have trouble in your marriage, you're praying that God will fix your spouse. But you know what a no-so prayer is? God bless me to be more patient. That's in his will. He wrote it down. Bless me to be kinder. Bless me to love my wife the way that you love me. I don't have to wonder if he's going to answer that prayer. I know he's going to answer that prayer because it's the same thing he would pray as if he was in my life. That's how I want you to think. When you go through your day, if, if Jesus were you, how would he pray in your day? If Jesus worked at KFC, if you work at KFC, how would he pray? If Jesus worked the night shift at the same shift that you do, how would he pray? If he was in your marriage, if he was raising your kids, how would he pray? And if he was watching your life every day and we know he is, how would he be praying for you? Pray that for yourself. And you don't have to wonder if it's going to happen because Jesus says it's a guarantee. So pray like Jesus. Okay, well, I don't have enough of an understanding to know how he would pray in my life. That leads us to the second thing. 
internalize the Word of God in order to materialize the life of God. Right? That's you spending time in the Word, not because it's the religious thing to do, but it's so that you understand what His will is. Right? You, you, you're not reading the, the Bible because, hey, you know, I got to read the Bible. It's what I do to kind of check this thing off. No, it is his will. It is his plan. It is his truth. And I want to live that out in this world. It's not written for recreational reading. And then you don't get any kudos. You don't get any stickers in heaven because you spent time reading the word. It's about you living it. Y'all, there's enough people on the planet that's read the Bible. But man, it's not enough who actually live the Bible. And, and if you want to have this productive life, if you want to abide in Christ, then do what you read. Again in the Bible, John's Gospel, John chapter 2, verses, verse 24, he says, Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. It says, if what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father, right? So you're asking, how do I abide? Abide in his word. Make make his word home. Make, Make his word the thing that guides your day, how you view people, how you view yourself. When things that don't go your way and you're thinking about the word, it changes your perspective of those circumstances, and it changes how you move. And so pray like Jesus and and internalize the Word so that you can materialize um, the life of God. And then, you know, the last thing is to live like you believe Jesus. Right? Because everybody, if you're here today, chances are you say, I believe in Jesus. Right? And we think about the, what he's done in his life. And, you know, he died on the cross for my sins. And we think about this event that happened. But I want you to not just believe what he did. Believe in who he is. And I mentioned this was the last of the I am statements in John's gospel. But what do those other I am statements mean for your life? I I believe he died on the cross for my sins. I absolutely absolutely do. But do you believe that he's the light of the world? Do you believe he's the the bread of heaven? Do you believe he's the, the good shepherd? Do you believe he is the word made flesh? Because if I believe that, see, that's my motivation to do all those other things. Right? Why, why, why would I pray like Jesus? Why would I spend time in his word? Because he is the word made flesh. How, how do I feel like I'll ever get out of this dark place in my life? Because I know he is the light of the world. When nobody cares for me, but now I know one person cares for me because he is the good shepherd. And he lays down his life. For me, oh, you know, there are other things I'd like to have happen in my life. It feels like I'd never be satisfied, but I remember he's the bread of heaven. He's what sustains me. He's what keeps me. If I lose my way, I know that he is the way. If I feel like I'm dying, I know that he is the life. When I'm being deceived and tempted, I know that he is the truth. And so I live based on him. Each and every day. Doesn't mean we don't get tempted. It doesn't mean we don't get knocked down, but he's the reason we get up. He's the reason we keep moving forward. Because we believe he is who he is. And I love what he says as an encouragement. If you wonder, okay, you know, all of this life spent, you know, do, do, do I get anything in return? He talked about joy. Did y'all see that in the last verse we read? He said that my joy would be in you and that your joy would be complete, right? All of the joy in it you've ever experienced in your life is incomplete joy. It was temporary. Some of the things that you find joyful might have been great, but it might have had some guilt on the backside of it. And it is an incomplete joy. 
But his is different. I don't know if, if, if any of you have had the benefit or the, or the blessing to grow up with really good home cooking, right? I don't take that for granted. But if, if I don't know if it was your mother, your grandmother, somebody that just, man, whatever they made. And when you have the same dish at other places, it just don't measure up, right? You know? my, my favorite dessert, y'all, is banana pudding. That's my favorite dessert. I don't eat it often. I can't eat it often. All right? We'd have to get, I don't know, a different camera lens if I ate it often. And, you know, I would get it. I'd sometimes go to a restaurant, I'd order the dessert, and they'd have banana pudding. I'd get banana pudding. And it'd be okay, but it wasn't my mama's banana pudding. Right, because you know it would either be more pudding and not enough wafers, you know, or the wafers would be dry and hard and crunchy on the top. She would have them, and it would be in the fridge and kind of get just soft enough. Oh my goodness, y'all! Right, my mama's banana pudding. Right, and, and, and if, if, if she just wanted to trick me to come over, if she would just, hey, I made some banana pudding. Okay, well, here's me. I, I can't. But here Jesus says, if you abide in me, you get my joy. My joy. You know, and I've tried enough of Jesus to know, you know what? I can anticipate his joy is better. Even if I don't know his joy, I've tried his truth. I've tried his forgiveness. I've tried his peace. And it was all good. And so I can only imagine, can you imagine what his joy is like? A joy that you don't ever have to give up? A joy that only increases with time instead of decreases? A joy that I can have forever? No matter what circumstance I'm in, I can be in a bad place and still have his joy. I can have people walk out on me and still have his joy. And so listen, y'all, I don't want anybody else's joy. I, it's great to have joy, but I want his joy. And to have his joy, I need to abide in him. I need to make him my home. And that's where I want to stay. And I'm praying that's where you want to stay. That's where you want to be. Maybe, maybe you're learning and listening to this and you're saying, you know what? I'm not connected with Jesus. How in the world do I get connected with Jesus? I'm this branch that's not going to produce anything. There's a thing that you can do with plants called grafting. And that's where you take something that's not demonstrating life and connect it with something that's living. And what you do, I mean, we might have a picture of it, is you can cut a little bit into a living plant and, and take that other branch that's not living and join it into that cut and you wrap it. And with time, the life in the living plant connects with the plant that wasn't living. And before you knew it, you can see towards the top, it may be hard to see, but there's a little green life coming out the top of what would have been just a dead stick. Y'all, that's how we all get connected with Christ Jesus. He allows us to connect with him through faith and to experience his life. And so if you've never given your life to Christ, if you've never surrendered yourself to him, I want to invite you to do so today. And at the end of your life, when you come before the vine dresser, you'll know for sure that you've lived a productive life. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, I just thank you, Lord, for your word and your truth. And I pray, God, that you will bless us, Lord, to draw closer to you, to love you as our first love to not hold anything up back from you or any area of our life, but to surrender it all for you and to you. That we would experience your life and that your life would manifest through ours. I'm praying for anyone that's in the sound of my voice, Lord, who needs to make that surrender, who needs to come and to abide in you, that they do so right now. 
wherever they are and know your joy. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.